Hi, thanks so much for joining me on The Same Drugs. I really, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you yet again. I don't think I've ever interviewed you for like a podcast or anything, and I don't know why, because it seems like we've known each other. <laughs> we've known each other online. We didn't actually meet in person until a couple of years ago, but we've known each other for some time now. So I'm glad for this opportunity, finally. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. I really, yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, I think that's the good side of the internet, right? It's like finding like minds or people you can kick ideas around with. So yeah, thanks for the invite. I appreciate it. Yeah, there are a few good things about the internet, I guess. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I've actually just made a run of t-shirts about how basically like how bad the internet is, but there are like tons of benefits. I think for, for at least someone like me who's kind of anxious, um, the negatives stick out more, but then I forget that actually the weight of things are you know, in favor of all the positives. So I'm trying to focus on that. Keep the PMA alive. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I, I, I used to think the internet was a really good thing. And then in the past, <laughs> it's <laughs> well, like few years, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I think when we met was when we met digitally on Twitter, like that would have been five years ago. And in that five years, things have become so much worse, like hyper polarized, like saturation of really far out ideas. Um, people can't even recognize the shared humanity one another. It's yeah, it's not it's not good for us as individuals or us collectively. So I'm I'm trying really hard to like reevaluate and redevelop my relationship with social media or anti social media. And so far, so good. Yeah, I mean, that means that I don't voice my opinion as much, but that also means I save a ton of time and energy <laughs> and get a bit of sleep. Yeah. Is there, are there any platforms that you actually enjoy using? Like, I find that I, I mean, I use Facebook for work, essentially, but I don't actually use my, my personal account very much because I just don't really like being on there. I, I, don't, I don't know if I really love being on any of the platforms. I sort of use them for certain purposes, but not too much. I um I know like people think Facebook's for like plebs, but I, I quite like Facebook. <laughs> and I um Instagram is my favorite of them. I just I set up a um what's the new vocal one? Uh oh right Clubhouse. Cl I, I, Clubhouse. I signed up for that and then I never used it. Yeah, I've never used it either, <laughs> but it seems kinda cool. Um yeah, I really just don't, I kept my Twitter account. I just don't go on there much. Like it's by far and away the most uh, unhealthy of all the platforms, I think. Like I yeah. think the sort of person who dominates that space and the limitations in communication there due to the character count and all that sort of stuff. It's so easy to like be misrepresented. Yeah, every time I go on there, I feel like hungover when I get off there. So um, I basically right. just check it once in a blue moon. I used to be kind of vociferous, but every time I go in there, I end up like just just a bad time. Yeah, yeah. I find that out of all of them, Instagram is the one that makes me feel le the least like drained and shitty after going yeah. on there after using it. So yeah, and it's funny. I just you know send some stupid memes and like see what your homies overseas are up to, and you know it's it's not it's not such an activisty space for me. Right. You know, like I talk about the work I do and the work I'm, you know, the work I'm tangibly doing, I'll share. And sometimes it's about some ideas or talking about, you know, well-being. But by and large, it's it's kind of a bit more balanced, I think, than some of the other platforms. Yeah. And so speaking of which, like we met on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. I was getting yeah in an argument. I, I think that for the first time ever. Yeah, I was like, yeah. and you, you kind of like, you were like, Megan, am I wrong? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I came to, you came to my rescue, and like, I just felt like, you know, um, I think Bridget Fetisi did a podcast once called like The Woke Gaslighting Us All. And I didn't even know, what, you know, I, I was completely uh, unaware of the space I'd found myself wandering into. It was like I'd wandered into quicksand or something, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah, you're like, no, you're good. Your your politics and your argument are fine. It's just, uh, yeah, it was really a shock to me to have been called out in, in that way uh, back then. Now I've, you know, spent the last five years kind of coming to terms with the shifted landscape I found myself in. Yeah, and I mean, especially, I mean, you're not like a 
uh, I mean, you're like a good listener. Like you're not out to argue with people. You're not combative. So probably for you, it was even more like shocking. <laughs> but I mean, I, like I, I have my moments when I've had a bad <laughs> sleep. When I've had a bad sleep, and then, like someone just comes at me, I'm in my head. I'm like, yo, fuck you, man. Like, but right. And I can be a bit snappy, but by and large, I try my best to be like. Mm. I don't want to get into this or why do you think that or okay, can we agree to disagree? Yeah. But I've had it in my moments, but increasingly I just I'm like, cool bro, whatever. Yeah. And I think like so what actually that that altercation, if you want to call it that, you know, five years ago or whatever, when we kind of connected, I mean I think I don't remember exactly what it was about, but I think it was along the lines of like, I think you were being attacked for criticizing, like, objectification or yeah. pornography or prostitution or something like that. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, you know, I came to start reading about, I feel a bit cringy saying it, but, like, feminist literature in my early 20s, right? And um, now, like, it's a bad thing to be a male feminist in, in some spaces, you know? And... I incre- I don't really even refer to like feminism or feminist thought or feminist academia b- because I'm kind of scared to these days because it shifted a lot since I started reading about it. Anyway, you know, five years ago, uh, I think one of the Kardashians did the, you know, nude selfie thing and just a guy over here who's like a radio host made a well-meaning post about how perhaps it's not the best role modeling for young women and I simply wrote Tautoko which is the Maori language for like yeah I I agree or I support you we need to teach healthier ways of validation end quote and it became uh like an part of an article about the 10 shitty things New Zealand men did on International Women's Day and it became this big Twitter thing and then our national newspaper got in touch with me and it became like a two-page interview with me about which was the interview itself with the national newspaper was cool. It was just kind of really an honest representation of who, who I am. And it kind of, which is like a really earnest person who, who tries his best, even if he muddles along and gets it wrong. Um, and it, and it was, but it was really illuminating. It was my first real clash with um, a younger generation of, I guess, activists because I got into the work I do now around sexual violence prevention, family violence prevention, you know, um, 2011, 2012, kind of officially. And it was older women who like basically grabbed me by the hand and pulled me into the space. Um, They really kind of were in favor of sort of the shit I was talking about at the time and asked me to be on the board of, a, of a, an organization called Rape Prevention Education, which is about, you know, sex and consent education in schools. And then I started doing stuff for White Ribbon, which is, you know, obviously a Canadian-originated uh, organization. And in different, you know, NGOs and government agencies um, started asking me to work for them. <laughs> and I was like, really? Okay, cool. Um but a lot of that work is generationally different and a little out of step for what's kind of, I guess, a more popular conception of um, perhaps feminism now. So, yeah, it was a stark awakening, but an important one because it did teach me to broaden my thinking and look at things from different perspectives. And while it was painful at the time, it did teach me to um, couch things in nuance a little more and be a little mm-hmm. less in my own thinking, which has really been like an evolution of how I've done the work over the, nearly the last 10 years. So I look for the positives in it. Yeah. And I mean, nuance is like sort of an unpopular thing these days. <laughs> Yo, I know. Found. Yeah. Like, and especially, I mean, I've been engaged in that conversation or debate or whatever you want to call it around objectification and like, pornography and prostitution for some time and sort of been also on the the wrong end of that debate as far as like the modern feminist goes really like the third wave feminists like the sort of younger generation um and of even the left um and so i guess to me like 
it wasn't super surprising the way that you were being attacked at the time because it has happened to me so many times before. Mm. But I mean, I guess I wonder what you, I mean, how do you, how do you deal with that kind of thing where you're saying, especially as a man, like you're saying, you know, like, I don't really know if this kind of objectification and sexualization is healthy for women and girls. And then a ton of women come after you and say, well, actually, you know, like, I really love objectification and you're a man, so you don't get to talk about this. Yeah. Like, at least I can say, like, well, I'm a woman, so I yeah, can, you know, yeah, like, yeah. I don't like to play those kinds of identity politics, but. No, it's, neither do I, but it's, it, it's, it's a difficult space to find yourself in because uh, we know that objectification is a contributing factor to some of the real tangible violence that boys and men perpetrate against women and girls. You know, like if we strip the humanity and the empathy out of boys and men and turn women into just objects to be there for one sexual gratification, that's a contributing factor. Like research in academia, like will tell will tell you that people who work in the spaces of violence prevention will talk to that, speak to that. But at the same time, there are millions of um, women and girls who are, uh, I guess, on the other side of that argument and kind of, I guess, pro subjectification. And I do get that there is some sense of empowerment and uh, presenting yourself to the world as you want to. And this is the thing. I'm not telling anyone not to do that. If you really find your worth and your value in your your sexuality or how you look and how you mm, share that with the world, like, yo, all power to you. I, I genuinely believe that. But at the same time, the same way boys and men are socialized in particular, you know, constructs of, of masculinity that involve, you know, domination of women and being um, hyper aggressive and emotionally stoic, young women and girls are, or well, young women, girls are socialized too, right? And I think we at least need to have a conversation about is this always healthy or good? Good. And I don't have that conversation publicly anymore <laughs> because I'm a man and I've gotten older as these conversation or conversations have evolved, right? So not only am I male, now I'm middle-aged and I'm also white. So <laughs> like... We're the we're... same age, so I don't really like you talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel old, man. Like I go to the gym and I roll with all the, these young bloods and I don't, I feel as energetic as ever. But you know how it is in, in this climate where our immutable characteristics kind of get to define whether we can talk about something or not. So I just pick and choose where I have that conversation. And um, I focus more on um, talking with, with boys and, and men in whatever space I'm invited to. And yo, dudes will talk to me. They'll be like, yo, but I get what you're saying, but what if, what if girls want that? And I'm like, well, that's cool. You know, uh, you know, uh, you know, the the latest sort of big sort of controversial pop culture topic was Cardi B's sort of song, WAP, right? And it's, you know, straight up a porn script. And just talking with boys, like, all good. Like, if, if the people you're involved in with sexually want to be like that, then that's not wrong. But at the same time, uh you don't have to partake in everything that culture encourages you to, right? Like yeah. if you if you think that there's something that you're not quite down with that's about, um, yeah, objectifying people, then you don't, you know, you don't have to take the invitation. So it's yeah. trying to find that, trying to find that balance, you know? Well, and so that's the tough thing is that, like, I talk to, I talk to men about, pornography a lot um just like men in my i don't mean like not all the time but it's like i i, I do <laughs> like, I'm about so i just show up at the bar of like so you guys <laughs> what porn are you watching oh yeah oh yeah yeah what's your what are you subscribing to right now what did you what? masturbate to yesterday <laughs> yeah yeah well, but that's the thing like that's the thing it's like so ubiquitous now like that's uh that would be like an unusual but 
shouldn't be topic conversation, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm bringing up probably more than like a lot of people do, and in a particular way, because I mean, so I, I'm genuinely curious. Like, I'm genuinely curious about people. I'm genuinely curious about the world. Like, I do want to understand. I want to have honest conversations, especially now. You know, my approach to these kinds of subjects, and probably all subjects, to be honest, has changed in the past five, mm. ten years. Um, Me too which is that I don't want to shame or harangue or like, you know, attack or, um, you know, I don't want to try to bully people into seeing things my way because at the end of the day, they're not going to see things your way. They're just going to tell you what you want to hear. And I don't want to hear what I want to hear. I want to hear the truth, even yeah, if yeah, what? what they're telling me is upsetting. Yeah. Um, so what was the question in that? So, like what? oh, good question. <laughs> I didn't ask you a question. <laughs> like, so where are you going with this? Um, like, I just, so I have a lot of conversations with men about pornography, you know, like with my friends or with guys that I'm dating and stuff like that. Um, and some of them feel awkward about that, but oh, well. Uh, you know, and often, <laughs> like, I mean, what can you do? Some conversations are awkward. But like, you know, I'll say, well, you know, I don't really, I don't like pornography. Like I find it kind of disturbing. I find it degrading. I don't find it sexy. And, you know, for a lot of them, it's kind of the first time that they've ever heard anybody say anything like that. And sometimes they'll respond to me and be like, but, you know, like all these women say they like it. And, you know, like all these women say that it's fine. And, you know, these people, maybe these people feel empowered by it or whatever. And I'll, you know, I'll be like, okay, well, if they genuinely feel empowered by it and if they genuinely enjoy it, great, good for them. But that's not the case for, for most women, I don't think. Um, but, you know, it's it's become a, almost a harder conversation to have because things like prostitution, pornography, objectification have been positioned mm. as empowering for women or potentially mm. empowering for women, and that if you criticize it, you're being Six basic, yeah, or, or like or phobic or anti-feminist, yeah, yeah, yeah. really. So how do you and, yeah. like? Yeah, yeah, that's a really really good question um, because. I've changed my thinking too. I used to be like, all porn is bad, all sex work is bad. Um, you're part of the problem if you're if you're part of the consumption of this. Now I've had to like sp split it out a lot more. So for for anyone watching who doesn't know what I do, I go and travel around New Zealand and Australia, and I speak in schools, I speak in businesses, I speak in um, prisons. Sometimes I talk to the military around. You know, violence prevention, um, that's gendered in nature. I talk about constructs of masculinity and I talk about porn. And when I'm talking about porn, I think it is important to understand that if we're talking about porn, it's a huge, huge cornucopia on the internet. Like anything and everything that I can't even imagine um, is out there. But I'm talking specifically about mainstream heterosexual porn, the sort of porn that you find on any sort of mind geek, mind geek being the parent company yeah. website of something like Pornhub. Like Pornhub, you know? yeah. Yeah, Pornhub had, I think, 42 billion visits last year. And I think it's like, a, it's, it's like 130 million, a, I don't know, a day? I'm not very good at maths. But it's just, that's just one website. It's like a stupid amount of content being consumed. And that shifts our understandings about what sex is and isn't and what, a healthy relationship is and isn't for anyone consuming that. And if you're consuming that without any sort of counter narrative, then that would be potentially dangerous. And as someone who speaks in schools all the time, I know that kids don't get um, the education they need to balance that out. So that's kind of where I find myself now. I try really hard not to say, yo, porn is bad or you're bad at looking for looking at porn like there shouldn't be a shame in that like the majority of people uh have a biological interest in sex and then there's a socialization to look into sex as well you know like having been a teenage boy once i had a lot of energy and time to um you know want to get laid or jerk off um you know i'm older now that's faded <laughs> but academically speaking that that remains true so um it's it's about trying to 
help boys and young men or young people in general understand that yo when we're looking at porn how does that juxtapose with what we know to be a, a healthy sexual experience or even a legal sexual experience because there's no talk about consent or coercion um in a lot of mainstream porn scripts you know if we think about the whole step daughter stepson these intrafamilial ancestral themes that are mainstream now like that's super problematic because it normalizes and blurs the line between legal and illegal sexual relationships and there's a whole range of again academic work um that shows that a lot of mainstream porn really normalizes gendered sexual aggression so you know again there are differences across the spectrum but a lot of mainstream porn is still really phallocentric it's about men's pleasure rather than female pleasure like consent is as assumed there's never any um chat about yo does this feel good or tell me to stop or do you know you know female performers are just um paid to pretend well, we hope that at least they're paid because we don't actually know what we're consuming mm -hmm. um that they like whatever it is that they're experiencing and a lot of what they're experiencing is physically painful or aggressive you know and and again if that's genuinely what you're into i swear to god i'm not trying to shame anyone for that you know i don't care how adventurous you want your personal sex life to be how many people you want to have sex with what sort of sex you want to have as an of age uh fully informed aware educated adult but our young people don't get that education, whether it's here in New Zealand or Australia or Canada or the United States, they get a lot of um, really shitty messages. And that means that young people are sexual assaulting young people. You know, I was talking to a, a colleague of mine who is a youth worker in youth justice. Uh, you know, young people have been in problems with the police and a lot of the sexual violence that she's dealing with she was telling me her own words, not mine. It was just straight up porn scripts from from the physicality of what the boys were doing to their victims, to the language that they used. Mm, there's a video I use in my presentations by, um, like I think it's a LA-based NGO called Be Frank, and, it, and it's called Porn on Me Too. It's a little dated now, but it's still a really good video. And you can hear a pin drop by the end of it because like, the, the young people that I will play it to are like, yo, because it's a group of young, regular dudes, right? And it's really nicely shot and they have to read a script and they have to guess whether is this a Me Too story or is this a porn script? And all the guys are like, porn, you know, like a plumber came around and then everyone kind of laughs. I think I've seen that porno. And then um, I came home late at night. My dad said he'd punish me, yada, yada, yada. And then it turns out obviously that they're all porn scripts and all these you know whatever audience i play that to and i've played that to tens of thousands of people kind of like stop and reflect that we have a problem when we can't distinguish between crime and pornography you know and, and i think that's what we really need to do a better job of if you want to look at porn all good but you, a you don't know what you're looking at and whether that was porn was made fairly kindly and consensually i don't know if you saw the new york times article that nicholas Christ nicholas christoph wrote last year i think it was do you see that piece i think so which can you remember it was enormous that? it was like a huge huge piece um that showed that a huge like a like you know a stupid amount of videos on pornhub and other mind geek open sites were made right. um with people who were victims of rape like there were actual rape videos of like passed out unconscious and underage girls. And underage girls. Who are being raped, yeah. Yeah, who are being raped, like, <laughs> to the point that, like, people making the videos would, like, pull someone's eye open and it would fall, because they were so, like, intoxicated. And then they'd, you know, do whatever sex act to them. And that was on Pornhub. And um, Christoph wrote this huge expose, and I think Visa and MasterCard, like, removed their services from Pornhub and... Um, Pornhub did like a huge cull of the videos that are on there. And I think you need to be like a verified content provider now or something. But the, the fact remains is that even the stuff that's up there is still 
the same old narratives, you know? It's just made yeah. legally, apparently. And I think that's a real shame because it's not just um, socializing boys and men to like hurting women and girls. A lot of the conversations that I have, and again, literature plays this out, if you can be bothered finding it and reading it, is it socializes girls to expect some degree of aggression. And then I talk to um, women my own age in their late 30s and 40s, and they'll, maybe they broke up with their husband or their long-term partner, and they'll go on Bumble or Hinge or whatever, and they'll start dating younger guys. I don't know if you've had this conversation. And then like, yo, this dude just started choking me. You know, and they were so uh, shocked by it. And the, the younger guy who's in his 20s or whatever, who's come of age through porn, you know, with your iPhone in your back pocket, but, you know, like, um, and porn's, you know, accessible, anonymous and affordable, to quote Cooper. Um, it, just don't think second, of, you know, they don't have a second to think about it. They don't think about even asking. And that's really sad and dangerous. So I think it's about having that conversation and language that people get, you know. So when I go out and talk to a rugby team or a room full of professional athletes, which is what I do a lot of the time, you know. You know, I run a workshop series here that brings like mixed martial artists and Muay Thai and kickboxers together. And we, I have this conversation, but I swear and I use, you know, I just speak how I'd speak in the gym because outside mm -hmm. of this work, I, I teach Muay Thai and kickboxing, you know, like I teach people how to fight <laughs> and like for money. And um, when you break it down, in language that the bros understand, they pause and reflect and get it. And it's cool, you know? And yeah. I think that's the problem with a lot of, um, you know, it's a lot of work is well intentioned, but it's lets the sort of perfect be the enemy of the good and it's not pragmatic in its approach. And that's where I've come to find myself. I'm like, yo, you gotta meet people where they are. Like no dude is just gonna like suddenly come out of an all boys school you like go to college socialized in this world that we all live in and suddenly have these radical conceptions of about sex and gender and patriarchy and power dynamics unless someone sits down and talks with them. It's well, like, and about porn, yeah. like it's well, like porn. they've grown up in this world where porn is completely normalized. It's so it's not it's not just accessible, it's impossible to avoid. You know, Impossible. it's on your phone. It's on your. It's on your Instagram. Like you don't even have to. You don't have to go to OnlyFans or to some like porn site or porn app. It's just everywhere. Like it's the backdrop to our lives. And when I'm speaking to an audience, I talk about how it's filtered through into mainstream culture. So if you look at like, you know, some like more more radical feminist organizations have talk about the ranges of clothing that are marketed to like young girls, like pre girls, like, you know, Playboy branded stuff and s similar sort of tropes. Or you think about the lyrical content of our top charting, you know, uh, Spotify, you know, artists on Spotify or iTunes or whatever. It is straight like taking how we see sex portrayed in porn and just putting it into a catchy beat. And again, I'm not saying don't listen to that music. Like, that's one of my biggest cognitive dissonances is like the hip hop that I listen to. And then like the yeah. political, like my brain, like is like, Oh, yo. <laughs> People Swish. ask me to defend. Cause I actually liked WAP, like not necessarily the lyrics, but oh, yo. it was like a good track. I was like, this it's is a, a good track. And I got in hot. so much trouble with feminists. Cause I was like, this is fun. And that's, I'm not defending anything else to say, but I, I like this track. I enjoy listening to it. And they're like, how can you? And I was like, dude, like I've been listening to much worse music than this. Cause I'm a hip hop fan since I was 15 years old. Dude. And at a certain point, I'm just like, eh, like, I'm not gonna, I, you know, like, like I like it. Like, I can't defend the content, but it's great music. Like, it's, yeah, what do you it's want me to designed say? to be super catchy. Like, and it's always been that way, you know, from NWA onwards. You know, if you think about the language, it's super misogynistic. And that's, kind of undeniable, you know, ASAP Ferg and, you know, or, you know, every popular artist has got some song that if you were to critique the lyricism of is real messed up, you know, like very pro sort of sexual violence and very pro 
you know, traditional gender roles and constructs of masculinity, like it all comes through. And then we wonder why, you know, in this way, way it is, it's because we were often really socialized to, to, to be this way and think these things. And so I think if we want to change that, it's about giving people like some critical filters. It's not necessarily about avoiding it. Like mm -hmm. look, at, I think about like the war on drugs, banning stuff has not worked. More people do drugs than ever before. You know, but it's about you know, here are some counter narratives. Here are some messages. Just because you're consuming this, doesn't mean that you have to recreate this. And 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 it's not just a one-off talk from a dude like me. It's like an ongoing body of work that is practical and pragmatic. And it's not like super ideological. It, it's it's actually got like mental, emotional, relational, physical health outcomes at the heart of it, rather than shifting how people think i think that's what we kind of need to do is you know yeah yeah i mean so i mean and this is part of the reason that i wanted to talk to you about it because i <clears throat> in terms of how i've changed my thinking and changed my my approach for example on the topic of pornography in the past i would have come at it from this approach that was like porn is bad and you shouldn't use porn. And if you disagree with me, then I guess you're a misogynist <laughs> or you don't care or you like, you don't care about women or whatever. Yeah. And so, and you know, and, and I know I have men in my life who I love, who are like my good friends, who are men that I date or whatever who use pornography and I cannot say that they're bad men because they're not yeah. bad men. Like, yeah. it's like, I don't, you know, and so I sort of, I tried to, I was like, how do I start having this conversation and how can I be, you know, I started to feel really, <clears throat> I started to be critical in my head of the way that a lot of radical feminists were approaching this conversation because I felt like, a, it was a little bit stuck in the past and a little bit naive because it was treating pornography as though it were all one thing. And like, you know, mm -hmm. it's all violent. It's all rape. Um, and a lot of it is violent and there is rape that happens. Mm -hmm. So I would never downplay that. Um, and also that it's not as ubiquitous as it is, you know, there's no line anymore. We talked about this earlier. There's no like, this is porn and you go to the porn website and that's where you find the porn. It's just everywhere. Like everywhere. everything is like girls sending nudes to boys in high school. Like that's kind of pornography in a way, right? Like, yeah. And, um, and like sexting on TikTok and stuff like that. Like, which obviously lots of people do. Um, and I just was like, you can't, you can't beat people over the head with your ideology and just say, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, and expect, and expect them to change. To change. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. you can't, you can't treat this as a black and white thing. It's not a black and white thing. You know, maybe there's some men out there who are consuming violent rape porn, and maybe there's some guys out there who are consuming pornography that isn't so harmful, and there is a difference. It's not all the same thing. I can't talk about this. I don't watch pornography. Like, mm. I don't like watching pornography. It doesn't turn me on. It makes me feel unsexy and upset a lot of the time, so obviously I'm not going to consume something that I don't like, but at the same time, in my, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm genuinely trying to understand what it is that men are seeing that I'm not seeing. And I recently sort of tried to have this conversation on Facebook and I got the worst comments, I'm sorry to say, were from the radical feminists because they sort of accused me of excusing men who yeah, use porn know, or excusing right. pornography or suggesting that we should accept it. And I was like, I'm, I just like, we have to have a real conversation. We can't mm. just repeat the same thing over and over and over again and expect it to go somewhere. People are just going to shut down and people aren't going to tell you what's really going on for them. And then how do we make a difference? Like, how is that a productive conversation? I really appreciate that. You, I find myself in a similar space now because I came at it all like earnest. I mean, I'm painfully earnest. It's probably apparent to anyone watching this. But <laughs> <laughs> like, um, I came at it like real earnest and I was like reading Arrow Livy and like, you know, like, uh, you know, books like Pornified and like Backlash and Susan Faludi and all this sort of stuff. And then things changed. 
and 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 it wasn't the era where you had to go to like the DVD section and walk through like some creepy curtain to like hire a porno and porn. Like this is the backdrop to everyone's sort of sexualization these days. And and I think um, we need to kind of address the world as it is rather than we we want it to be. Right? Like porn's not going anywhere. But how do we shift people's consumptive habits? Perhaps might be a better approach. I think it's Michael Flood, who's a professor in Australia around masculinities and violence prevention. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work, but yeah, I know him. Yeah, he, I think he even wrote an article, and he's way stauncher than I am about maybe we need to encourage people to look at like ethical porn, like porn that you pay for and you pay the subscription for, and we know the um, situation and circumstances under which it was made. And that we know that all people involved in it are choosing to be there. Do, do, do you know what I mean? You know, I, I was listening to uh, Barry Weiss talk to someone who's an, got an OnlyFans account last night on her uh, her new podcast, Honesty. Honesty. Oh, okay. Honestly. I haven't listened to it yet, but I will. I, I, li- I like her thinking a lot of the time. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and again... It was, in, it was, I have to admit, like, interesting for me to listen to because the performer has, like, this hugely monetized OnlyFans account. And I know that the majority of people on OnlyFans aren't making millions, right? But some are. And maybe that is, a le- they're legitimately freely chosen, freely given pathway to financial gain and success and the freedom that they want. And who am I, as a man, to tell them, not to do that right and so i try really hard to find the balance of it and so when i'm talking to you know boys or young men or older men uh i try and give them a little choice of like well maybe you don't have to consume it you know it, it's not us to tell women what they can and can't do with their bodies or their sexuality and whether they want to commodify that or not but it is on us to decide what what it is that we consume if we are going to look at porn do we really want to look at some of them like there's some super fucked up stuff out there like and you know porn can get boring if you're just looking at the same stuff all the time and people want like weird as shit and Mm -hmm. i i was looking at Pornhub's own analytics the other day and i was surprised to see that there is super mario porn or i'm not sure if you know what among us is it's like a quite popular video game that um, my that like seven year old kids and stuff play there's like among us porn and to me that's dangerous for if you're a kid and you're searching among us or you're searching for super mario and then you find like some pornified version of that that might be either animated or people cosplaying it that's like a really early introduction to porn. You know, like kids are looking at porn like 10, 11, 12 these days, um, well before their brains are capable of really rationalizing it. And then if that becomes habitual, then obviously they're like synaptic um, pathways getting formed, you know? So you can be social, you can be not socialized. You can be like physiologically wired to have your arousal pathways through things which aren't always healthy do you know what i mean like so i've spoken in schools and like parents have hit me up like yo my 17 year old son's got like erectile dysfunction my 16 year old like can't get erections when he's having like uh, he's engaged with actual like actual actual, like 16 year old who's similarly sexually inexperienced to him because he's either been like jerking off to like shrek videos (laughs) that are he's like this is all that works for me now (laughs) yeah yeah that's it but that's it yeah, or like, or they need like, you know, they've been watching like high called gangman porn and anal videos and all sorts of, you know, again, if you're an adult and that's what you want to do, yo, get crazy. But I think we need to be cognizant that our young people are affected by this too. And then it's shifting the the boundary out further and further for some of them, you know, it doesn't yeah. teach good sex a lot of the time. No, well, that's the, I mean, there's a million issues with pornography, but one of them is that it's like teaching men and boys that women and girls enjoy things that, you know, often 
don't enjoy like things that are painful or uncomfortable or whatever. And it's like, well, this is what I see all the time. And that chick seems to love it. So I guess this is what I'm going to do. And they're not taught to ask because that's not what they've learned from pornography. Like they're not taught to be, to pay attention to what the other person wants or to communicate or to understand the other person's body and like physical responses. I think it's just so much about like, Again, not all, and I don't know, but like so so much of it is about you just start doing something, and this is what you do, and it doesn't even it doesn't even come into the conversation. Conversation, that there would be, like a conversation, and it doesn't even have to. Like I get I get really annoyed around this conversation about um, consent when it's like, oh, well, you should ask every time you do everything, because I don't even th- think that's true. Because I think so much of our communication is nonverbal mm-hmm. and there's other ways to communicate especially in terms of sex and like in the bedroom so it doesn't have to be like sign a contract <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, are, that, like that's, are you yeah. okay with choking and like how many to, like, <laughs> like i think like people seriously try to design apps where you like sign a digital waiver before you get involved in a sexual like, <laughs> do that. like no i like you know like when i like i said like you know i'm in a long-term relationship now but i dated a lot before this and you know doing this work i would be like overly i have i've had women i dated who'd be like you're overly consensual just like stop <laughs> you're like can you stop, stop asking, asking like yeah, is this okay asking, is this i will okay? tell you okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah i was that guy like you're you sound know. a little bit annoying i'm joking <laughs> yeah. no, I was the, your annoying. heart's I'm in the right place yeah, yeah. <laughs> And um, they're like, yo, you're going to kill that. You're going to kill this. This would be terrible because you're, you're killing it with consent conversation. But it's finding yeah. that balance. And I think that's what porn doesn't do, right? And our schooling system doesn't do that. Whether it's, I'm not sure about Canada, but I imagine it's kind of similar uh, to here. We don't always have like the same education across the schooling system. Like every school in New Zealand gets to pick and choose. And it's not like a national framework. So some schools have really good um you know classroom modules or external speakers that they do a body work others none at all and so it's how do you give people the language to negotiate uh sexual experiences that are not over over the top <laughs> or um not not the porn script you know and i think i think there's something that we we need to do a better job of uh as a society globally you know mm-hmm. um for everyone's sake, you know, for 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 all people, you know. I know we're talking in heterosexual terms, but it's the same. I've had gay friends or people who are, um, are gay on the internet tell me that a lot of like gay male porn follows the same sort of script, where there's like an aggressive person and a passive person, and there's like a not like a mutuality of pleasure in it, right? So. Yeah, I think it's something that we all need to have more open conversations around. Like a lot of, you know, I talk to parents too, right? And parents are so squeamish when you have this conversation. And I'm well, like, they probably you're... don't want to think about their boys oh, using they're... that pornography. Yeah. And it's the reality. I mean, I get it. Like, and I wouldn't not... want to either. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but you kind of have to. Like, you you kind of have to have these conversations with your kids in, in language that um is age appropriate right what kind of so what kind of conversations do you have like i think that this is obviously something that parents struggle with a lot because they know that it's happening i mean maybe some of them don't and if they don't then they should really get real about what's out there and what (laughs) their kids are looking at but you know it's a really uncomfortable thing to talk about in the best of times never mind when it's with your kid so like what do you say like how do you talk to your kids about about what they're inevitably going to see and and consume online. I think it's about picking the moment and letting your kids play the media that they can, not necessarily hardcore porn. Like you you don't want your kid to be like watching hardcore porn while you're cooking dinner. Right. But you know, let your kid play the music or watch the music videos that they're into. And then ask them, Oh, what does that mean? You know, like why, what, what is this? You know, like, what do you, why do you, what do you get out of this? Like, use questions to see if they're actually having any sort of like uh, understanding of what they're consuming. And I think that can be a really cool way of bridging that sort of divide between parents who have zero idea about what their youth are consuming 
and saying, oh, yeah, cool. Well, if you want to talk about that in a non-judgmental way, it's about giving them that, hey, if you have any questions, you can always ask me. I think a lot of kids do want to hear um, about sex and relationships and don't feel they have a safe space to ask that in their home. So the internet fills that gap, right? Um, and obviously on the internet, it's porn. So it's about kind of just opening up the possibility of any conversation and not freaking out when your kid asks you about what's a blowjob when they're 10 or what, whatever it may be. You know, I think also, yeah, it's about trying to find, do it in like an unconfrontational way as well. It's about trying to like push our feelings down and our best intentions down to be as non-judgmental as possible and picking the, the, the time. You know, some some educators say that like going for a, when you're driving with your kid because you both are kind of like looking straight ahead rather than directly at each other is like a good time to be like, yo, so I read this article about porn. Is that something that, you know, they talk about in school or what's this porn education like in your school or, you know, figure out how you can actually use sort of open ended questions rather than yes, no questions. Because kids are just like, nah, 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 nah I don't want to talk about this. Whereas if you kind of try your best to be a bit mm, thoughtful in how you're framing your questions, at least it lets them know that if they have a problem or they have a query or they have a curiosity, you can help them find the answer. Oh, I'm not entirely sure, but let's check that out together or let's find this website as opposed to this website. You, does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like it's, it's a mutual education for a lot of adults. Like, Obviously, you and I have an academic and activist and professional interest in these things. Most people don't. Most people are just trying to pay the fucking rent and like but keep the keep the lights on, right? And and have a bit of fun sometimes. But so they yeah. don't have the ability and time to go and read all the latest stuff. Yeah. Or if I they think... do read something, it's sorry. To cut no, you. no, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say there is like a lot of mainstream sites which are not giving a critical take on these things. It's really like porn affirming as it stands rather than a more nuanced take. So it's not saying it's about finding something that's like, hey, not all porn is bad or interest in sex is bad or like curiosity in sex act A, B, and C is, you know, we don't want to like make people think that it's just missionary position with the fucking lights off, right? And like get wild. But this is a way that you can do it that everyone has a good time. And that consent is uh, ascertained rather than assumed, you know, like even with the affirmative body language, you know, mm -hmm. um, we need to, we do need to help people understand that the absence of no doesn't mean yes. And again, at the same time, back to what we were talking about earlier, it's not like a written contract to how do you like, does that feel good? Or like, do you like this or harder, softer, you know, like whatever it is, like, how do you help people just slip that into their sexual experiences because porn doesn't do that. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I, I find that part of the problem with like maybe what you could call an activist approach or a, the radical feminist approach to the conversation around pornography, for me anyway, um, is that people often expect everyone else to be as engaged as they are in terms mm. of the ideology or the data or, you know, the the analysis and like you say most people don't most people just aren't not going to spend that much time studying the feminist analysis <laughs> pornography <laughs> like i sorry yeah. <laughs> they're not. it's, it's just, hard work yeah yeah and they're just you know dealing with their day-to-day -day life and maybe they're dealing with a kid um i guess i mean I know that, so, you know, there's a really, really big problem with pornography, of course, is that kids are being exposed to it really mm -hmm. young and they're, it's completely normalized and mainstream and this is how they're learning about sex and this is how they're learning about the opposite sex and so on and so forth. And, you know, in many cases, they're sort of training their minds to be turned on by certain acts that, like you say, might be like harmful or violent or even, you know, like sexual assault. But there's also like, I mean, do we need to be having a conversation about what adults are consuming and, you know, how what adults are consuming, how that might be impacting maybe a relationship, for example? Yeah, I, I fully agree uh, that we do need to do that. You know, um, 
No, so a, a lot of the work I do is around um, the social construct of masculinity, right? And I talk with all sorts of men about this, um, from schools to, you know, I've spoken in prison a couple of times, I've spoken to you know, business, all sorts of people, right? And, you know, porn is one of those sort of key drivers of stereotypical masculine constructs, if we're talking broadly and generally, right, about being sexually aggressive and sexually dominant and hyper promiscuous and, you know, subjugating women. And increasingly the research and the data in the anti-family violence, anti-sexual violence space will tell us that um, that mainstream sort of hegemonic concept of masculinity um because there are multiple masculinities right gay masculinity working class masculinity black masculinity but the mainstream sort of one that we all encourage to aspire to is actually considered to be um one of the root causes of gender-based violence you know if boys and men are conditioned to certain beliefs and structures and behaviors including emotional repression um, in a culture which continues to devalue women, then often that can manifest in physical violence, right? So it's important to understand that if boys and men are growing up with a steady diet of porn and that porn is routinely um, all the things that we've talked about today that devalues women and turns them into only their sexual worth, or as you know, stupid sluts that you can coerce to give you a blowjob in the back of the car and then you dump them on the side of the road. Like that's a common theme in mainstream porn, right? Or like the the, the casting couch, or ha ha ha, we didn't pay her after. Like these are pretty gross themes, you know. Or I manipulated my stepsister to give me a blowjob because I wouldn't tell her to. Then I wouldn't tell my parents that she came. I'm like like. This is mainstream shit. I'm not, I'm not going to like the black hole of the internet. It's like that's going to play out negatively in our ideas about what manhood is and our ideas about how we view wom women and girls. And in the company of only men, men can be really fucking gross. Like they, that locker room talk is not just the sole domain of Donald Trump. And I say this as yeah. someone who came of age in combat sports, you know, like combat sports is the single most positive thing that I ever got into, right? Like I, I had a pretty dysfunctional childhood and fighting saved my life is the slogan on the back of my gym's t-shirts, right? But it also is as much as it's changing and more women and girls are involved in it, which is a wonderful thing. And I'm really excited about that development. But it is still got you know, these traditional tropes of manhood and masculinity. And sometimes, you know, guys recreate that banter. And, and a lot of that banter is porn influenced. So it's not until I see a lot of dudes starting to have families of their own. It's, you know, you hear the joke, like every dude becomes an instant feminist when they have a daughter. It's, it's kind of like a thing because I think a lot of guys, uh, in my experience, at least doing the work and then personally, don't have a lot of female friends that aren't sexual in nature. You know, they don't like hang out and get coffee or socialize with women for whatever reason that may be. I'm not sure if that's true of your experience, but. I mean, I like, I have a lot of uh, male friends and I've always had a lot of male friends. So I have been privy to all those conversations. <laughs> Yeah, right, right. You know what I'm talking about, right? So one of the boys, worse, right? But I, I really know how men talk when, like, yeah, right. when women aren't know. around. And so I'm kind of, and then I'm not really easily offended. Like, I know that, you know, when you say things like that, people accuse you of being, like, a cool girl. But it's like, well, yeah, yeah, that's it, a, doesn't, that's it doesn't It doesn't. necessarily bother me that much. And I, I know how disgusting men are. <laughs> I know Yo, how gross I'm they sorry. are. <laughs> we are. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm not I'm not delusional about that at all. But I think that there's a lot of people who don't do that kind of intersex um 
Socializing. Uh, socializing. Yeah. Like yeah. I have a lot of female friends who don't have male friends. You know, the men yeah. that they know are their family members or their boyfriend or their husband or whatever. And, you know, there's lots of men who maybe don't have close girlfriends either. But it creates like, I think some women are genuinely like totally shocked and appalled to discover not only, you know, what men are watching in terms of pornography, what the men in their lives are watching in terms of pornography, but how they talk and how they see women. And it's just, it's really, men are different than women. Like whether that's because of evolution or socialization, obviously like it's a combination of both and biology and all sorts of things, but it's, it doesn't, it's really unhelpful. And I really wish that we were, you know, I really, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm really wanting people to understand the truth and reality and try really hard not to be crazy judgmental about it. Yeah, I'm I'm the same. So, you know, to answer your question, like I do think porn has a negative role in the socialization of boys and men into masculinity in those construct those constructs. Not all obviously not all men, you know, right? But sorry to even use the phrase not all men, but um perhaps a majority, right? And that's detrimental to boys and men you know, as much as it's detrimental to women and girls and, and or, or people who are, you know, on the gender spectrum or, um, but at, yeah, so it's, so, so for when in my work, I'm like, yo, you hear that sort of banner and bullshit, maybe you need to extend a bit of empathy or ask a dude why that's funny or like figure out how to be a circuit breaker for that cultural transmission of shitty ideas of which porn is a contributing factor. Mm-hmm. You know, if we want if we want men to treat women and understand and believe that women are equals, then mm, deconstructing and challenging a lot of those tropes is really important because the fact is, like, a lot of men are just going to listen to men, like, however shitty that is. So I think we need to em- empower men and educate men and bring men into this conversation rather than other them and ex- and expect them to suddenly get it like out of thin air when they've had a lifetime of being socialized one way. Yeah. And I think it's true that it does, it, you know, it sinks in more when it's men talking to other men or men talking to boys again, for better or for worse. And, you know, I've tried to sort of explain what it is that I don't like about pornography to the men in my life. Um, And I don't know that they really understand. Like there's something part of this. So like I posted on Facebook this week, like, you know, essentially like, am I, what am I missing here? And not in uh, like, what am I missing here? But it's like, there's obviously (laughs) like, you know, I was being serious. Like, I'm like, what is it that you're seeing and enjoying that I'm not seeing and enjoying? I'm trying to understand what you're getting out of this. Um, And you know, there's, there is a, a real lack of understanding, I think, in terms of women's upset around pornography. I think a lot of women are upset about pornography for a variety of reasons. Maybe their partner is watching pornography and they feel like it's cheating or they're like, oh, do you like her better than me? Like, what am I not giving you that that you, you need to go to this? Or they're like, oh, you're into this, like you're a gross pervert or mm. whatever. And then men respond by being like, what? like, what are you talking about? Like, there's nothing wrong with this. I've been doing this forever. All my friends are doing this. Mm. Like it's, it's hard. I think, I think it's, I'm not an expert on this. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but boys and men, you know, biologically are more visually stimulated than women and girls when it comes to sexual arousal. Right. And so, uh, images of naked women if we're heterosexual or videos of them having sex or doing sex acts and stuff is like stimulating and then obviously there's a huge um dopamine release when we orgasm to pornography then uh it can start out as a like it's just a natural curiosity and this feels really good and like there's a physio- physiology to that. And, and when you are like really horny as a teenager and there's an easy, simple way to 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 um, address that by just logging onto your iPhone for like three minutes, then it can be something you do without thinking, right? But then as you continue that as a behavior, 
and perhaps what it, it used to arouse you be, doesn't anymore and you need you have all these different curiosities and it gets a bit more violent or more aggressive or more weird you know um then you can kind of like just slip into it without even considering it what you're consuming you know if we understand you know data wise that boys start looking at porn at you know 10 11 12 you know you, you don't even have like a um developed brain like your frontal cortex that makes rational decisions isn't set till you're like 25 right so you've had this whole you know decade of um wiring your sexual arousal to particular images movies and otherwise online right and so the sociological critique of things just hasn't even factored into into your the development of your sexuality so it's i think we need to understand that you know like masturbating feels good and if what no one's ever taught you that what you're masturbating to isn't necessarily great or it's damaging or it's harmful to the people who are making that pornography or to yourself or to potential for sexual partners. Um, you know, it's not, it's not boys and men's fault, but I do, I would argue that it's on us to work to, you know, offer some kind of narratives to that. And that's the problem. Like, where do you go to learn about sex? Where do you go to learn about how to go down on your girlfriend? Where do you go to learn about um, group sex or any any sort of kink that you might want to learn about in a healthy, safe, consensual, ethically produced way? Like that's really hard. If you don't have any money or you, you, you could get Pornhub for free or then you have to like pay to subscribe on, to uh, like an ethically made porn site that might have like – feminist um ideology behind it and it is like a healthier content then for a lot of regular dudes they're just gonna take the free one right you know i just want to jerk off i'm not gonna like sign up and into all my personal details mm-hmm. and, and uh, yeah so it, it's it's a hard one i think i think it's increasingly i think we need to bring more dudes into the fold if i'm honest with you and i i'm not entirely sure how to do that and if i it, from my point of view i think you need to bring like kind of like bro dudes who kind of get it into it as well not someone who's um just not relatable you know like we need lots of different voices for lots of different audiences but most guys aren't um aware of like all of this stuff we're talking about this is very nuanced niche stuff and we can forget about that given that this is our life you actually need to find a way to reach people in um, ways that they understand. And, and by, you know, like Nike is, has got a million and one different faces for a million and one different campaigns, right? So does Coca-Cola. So does any sort of brand that is trying to sell their product to you. Well, it's the same with our presentation of ideas. You need the right messenger with the right message at the right time for the right audience. Yeah. And, and I don't know if we're doing a good job of doing that right now. I don't think we are. I mean, and I think it's true. Like you want somebody who's like a normal kind of like bro like cool <laughs> guy. Like I know that it sounds cheesy to the like, even cheesy, say, but, but it's but like it's this is you like nobody, you're not going to take somebody seriously who you think is naive or out of touch or like phony or like kind of lame. And if you're trying to, address regular men or boys then you do have to think about your approach and about the messenger that does matter yeah um a call to men is an organization that tony porter started in the united states and i think they do a pretty good job of doing that like they get guys who used to be nfl players or sports stars or just relatable dudes to run workshops around america right and um i think if we could like mainstream those sorts of approaches that's going to be really positive because as, 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 as many boys who are you know consuming heaps of porn you have to also consider that boys are also consuming shit from the manosphere and mra shit and like feminazis are bad shit as, as well and i know that when i used to go into schools when i was first sort of doing this work and i had like this hyper not hyper but i had a more uh confronting delivery of this conversation those yeah. boys would queue up afterwards to like push back and as i've learned to um nuance my presentation 
of these concepts and these ideas and ways of being, it happens kind of less. And, and and I'm actually, yeah, I'm proud of myself for doing that. And I think there's a there's there's a teachable moment for other people in that, right? Like, how do we couch our our passion and what we know, like academically and things that to be empirically true, and there's qualitative and quantitative data behind it. How do we couch that in a way that's um, consumable, right? Yeah, I so I wonder, I mean, do you think there's any, do you think it's ever worthwhile to encourage men to stop using porn, like to say, you know, this isn't good, maybe you should stop, or maybe you should watch less, or is it just maybe you should reconsider what you're consuming? Yeah, I do, actually. So again, that's, you know, it's a nuanced thing. I did this interview for Fight the New Drug um, mm -hmm. maybe two or three years ago, who have who are explicitly like an anti-porn organization. No, I've never been sure if they're faith-based or not. I get the feeling that they are, but they do a really good job of making pretty cool, relatable content for people. But it became like a super viral video. It was wild. Like I had people from like all around the world like DMing me. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is a lot. It was like a tidal wave. And um, a lot of them were men who really struggled with what porn had done to them. And, and how they just couldn't enjoy sex with their girlfriend or their wife anymore and or how they were wasting all their time on porn and they just would fucking find themselves just like late to work or, you know, missing appointments. And porn it does have the same addictive nature, I would argue, as social media. Mm -hmm. And many of us struggle with our social media use. It's designed to keep us on the screen all the time. And in this time where um, so many of us are alone, like Generation Z is the loneliest generation, right? Um, or we, we're overly anxious, or we're socially awkward, and we also at the same time do want to feel connected. Porn can be a shitty simulacrum for, simulacrum, is that how you say that word? For that, right? Like it's, a, it's the next best thing. Yeah. And so for people like that, um, I would argue that, yeah, you need to learn how to wean yourself off it, not just for the what it's teaching you about gender relations or your um, your concepts of masculine and all that sort of shit that I've been talking about today, but also for like the the what it's doing to you, you know, like it's not good for you and it's not good for your the health of your relationship. It might not be good for your mental health if you're getting like you know, arousal problems that's symptomatic that there's some shit going on that's not ideal too, right? Um, so yeah, I, I definitely, it's like drugs, man. Like a harm reduction approach is a good approach. Abstinence only works for some people in, in recovery. Harm reduction works for others. So it's about assessing well, what's your relationship with porn? Like how is that impacting your offline sexual experiences? Is it prohibiting? Is it prohibiting them? Or are you finding yourself like cruising weirder and weirder shit and you're kind of troubled by that? You know, I've got some funny memes I'll send you later. I think a lot of dudes, <laughs> as soon as they have an orgasm looking at porn, then they look at, they're like, oh, oh, fuck, what have I been looking at? Like, this yeah. is some gross shit, right? Yeah, like the shame is coming from within. The shame not is from coming without. strong. So and it's like, not Ugh. God, right? It's not, <laughs> it's not a with me. Yeah, yeah, what is wrong with me? <laughs> and, uh, you know, like, you know, I, I've been a pretty steady consumer of porn up and, you know, all through my youth, right? And I had to go through this process of weaning myself off porn. Um, I, did, I wasn't just like, born like with all this these conceptions and education i'm talking to you about now i had to read a lot and talk with my lovers and i've actually had this i don't know if this is tmi but like i've reached out to like girlfriends that i used to hang out with and be like yo i stick to more porn and like it, it affected my sexuality and our sex life and if you ever wanted to talk about that like I mean, I wasn't like hanging people from the ceilings or anything like super out of it shit, but like there's kind of like a, I don't know, a, a lack of emotional intimacy, I think, that can come from a pornified conception of what sex is. Totally. And porn is very physical and it actually, I think, is a barrier to emotional connection. And I might know that might sound real corny, 
but that's how I was came to sexuality, right? I didn't think about how to, I don't know, make love. I didn't learn how to like fuck, <laughs> do, do you know, through yeah. a, an, ed, an education in porn. And, well, it, and, took, that's, and it, took time to, it took time to unlearn that. And, and I guess I wanted to have that conversation with women that I'm still friends with, even from a long time ago. Like I'm friends with lots of exes for whatever reason. Um, whilst being in a long-term relationship now. And I'm actually really, every sort of chat that I had like that has been really cool, like really, really cool and really um, personally informative, but also professionally informative. And, and it makes me reflect that on a preventative lens, it would be great if we could do a better job talking to all people about, hey, if you are going to consume porn, that doesn't have to be the way that you have to have sex. And there's... And I know it's, it sounds corny again, but there's more to sex than just the physicality of it. You know, there are, you know, there are emotional and mental health, uh, even if you want to go there, spiritual components to, like, sexual connection. Totally. And how do we have that conversation? Not, not for uh, a morality, but for a better experience, like a better experience of yeah, being for human. better connection. I mean, for yes, I mean, one of the things that I worry about in terms of pornography and men's porn consumption and, you know, women's porn consumption, you well, know, yeah, like often is, yeah. when I'm talking about this, people will be like, women watch porn too. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I, know, like, I, know, I, know. I know I'm mean, i not having sex with women. So I'm concerned about what the men I'm having sex with are consuming, but also like the vast majority of porn users are men, but of course yeah. there's women who it's, use it too. It is changing. Right. But yeah, it, that's true. That's true. That is changing, and um, you know, going back to when I was single and dating, like um, partners would suggest pornified, you know, do this, and I'd be like, "Really? Um, are you sure? <laughs> like, I'm down." <laughs> like, I thought I wasn't supposed to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and it is interesting, as I guess, an, you know, I'm writing a master's degree in masculinity and shit, and this is my work as someone who has these kind of explicit conceptions to have this personal professional uh, okay cool like i'm down but i really would reflect on where that came from you, do, do you know what i mean yeah but again, I mean, that, that, that brings a nuance into it like some women do like certain um pornified sex acts and that's not wrong we just need to uh ensure that the language and understanding around consent and coercion is is widespread and explicit and everyone knows how to have those chats so people aren't harmed. Yeah, and I mean, I do, I want women, especially young women, to think about, you know, do you actually like this or do you mm. like it because you think he likes it? Like, are you liking that you think it's going to turn him on because you know that he's jacking off to this when he's watching that's, pornography that's, or do you no. genuinely enjoy this? And you, I mean, that's a whole learning how do you thing know, that you right? go like, through as a young woman yeah. either way, but that's like a hard thing when you're young already, a young woman is to stop thinking only about what he wants and his needs and think about what you want and think about your needs and what you're enjoying because, you know, women are not socialized in that way in our culture so much. Totally. And that's, you know, that's dead true of all my, all my work and all my experiences, you know. I don't know. I'm nervous about having that conversation publicly, right, because I don't want to be seen to be telling women what they can and can't enjoy or what they do and like i i don't really know you know so yeah i mean I that might do you know sorry. what i mean like no well, no, no, no yeah no, i mean sorry. it might be a conversation that's easier when women have it with other women who knows but it is like i mean that's it is it is a hard conversation to have because you don't want to come off as telling people like you don't like what you actually like but in a lot of cases that is true and i can say that from experience like i was a young woman like mm. you know and i am a woman and i have sex with men and so i know when i think back to what how i felt when i was 19 years old or what i was doing when i was 19 years old and i mean i was lucky enough to have not grown up in a porn culture 
but you that's a time when you already feel super insecure you're not confident you don't know how to these have these conversations and you're just learning what you like and enjoy already and then now piled on top of that is all this like this imagery and these messages that are saying like you know this is what sex is this is what you should you should be into anal sex like yeah, you should be into not, choking. Cool. you should be in yeah. It. yeah then you're you like uptight or you're a prude or yeah. boys aren't gonna like you like yeah. you're not gonna like it's so normalized for girls to send nudes now that i think that that's what they think they have to do to get a boyfriend or get a boy to pay attention to them and i find that really kind of upsetting me too you know I, like i said i've talked to tens of thousands of teenagers and uh a lot of them will come up and talk afterwards or sometimes we do workshops and there is a social expectation that if i'm going to be the cool girl and i'm going to get the cool boy then i have to perform i have to perform this hyper sexualized version of myself and i have to be down with everything and i have to digitize myself sexually and be cool with that and if i'm not then i'm i'm not you know i'm not cool you know i'm not going to get the guy that i want to go out with or the attention that I want from the dude I might have an emotional crush on. And the sad thing is, is that because porn is so ubiquitous, and I would argue that porn culture has seeped through pretty much all media tropes these days, that humans are kind of really transferable. And, and that we're, we're really, like, there's an intersectionality, intersectionality, intersection, what's the word I'm looking for? That's not the word I'm looking for. It's, there's a, um, disposability sorry excuse mm -hmm. me getting confused mm -hmm. there's a disposability uh transactionality is wanted to say to our sexual experiences yeah. so like guys like will store like folders on their phone of like nudes from young women that have sent them and pass them around and there's like a you know transactional nature to that it's not a human being anymore it's someone that's kind of titillating you know you can jerk off to or whatever or it's funny and that's a, a, a real shame. And we've had big outcries in the mainstream media here in New Zealand and in Australia where I visit as well for work, where, you know, boys uh, um, in private chat rooms talking about, like, rape or um, putting videos up where they're bragging about the girls that they took advantage of when they're really drunk and there's no consent. And um, it's made headlines here, but nothing has been done to really stop access to porn. There's no age verification or any of these sorts of technological um, approaches to not banning porn or saying don't look at porn, but to at least pushing back the age of first exposure. And, and I would say that's a problem because um, if we don't do something, things aren't going to get better. You know, we're, we're, when was Me Too? right? And have statistics changed around sexual harassment, sexual violence, sexual assault? Not at all. You know, like I've been reading the same sort of figures out about family violence or sexual violence for years now. And, and um, we need some generational shifts to happen uh, when it comes to, I would argue, indoctrination into pretty um, anti-female conceptualizations and also around masculinity and, and i think porn is one of the key ones i think i mean one of the one of my primary concerns around pornography is like what's actually happening to the women who are in pornography and oh, I, I don't think yeah, that's fucked up did you watch um Sorry to cut you off again. Okay. I'm pretty. I obviously get really like passionate about this shit. And yeah, like, same. I have my coffee and I'm keep like, interrupting oh. each other over and over. Sorry. You, finish your question. Finish your question. No. Uh, well, I mean, okay. So I think you know. Again, when I'm talking to men about pornography, I'll often bring that aspect up and be like, well, you know, like a lot of those women in those videos not only are not enjoying themselves but they come from histories of abuse. Um, mm. And you have to like, you have to think about and ask yourself why a woman would participate in something like that. And often these are people who are not, um, you know, that have trauma in their past, they're not mentally healthy or addicted. They're in, they're doing this out of desperation, essentially, you know, mostly for the money. And are you thinking about like, 
what this person, who this person is. Like this is this is part of the dehumanization aspect that we get from pornography is that you forget that this is like a real person mm. with a whole life and you're not thinking about that. And I think a lot of men, some men may just be in denial about that reality because they want to watch porn and they don't want to have to think about the fact that this might be a really fucked up person um, or a person who's been sexually exploited or sexually abused or whatever. Or they maybe they don't care. And um, a lot of them maybe just, They've never even thought about that before. They don't realize. Yeah, this is so what you're talking about is exactly what led me to sort of like start this process, you know, I guess coming up 20 years ago. It's because I started, you know, I was listening to heaps of hardcore and punk rock and like really it was the time of like um, uh, like the Zapatistas and everyone was opposed to like neoliberalism and, you know, like the Seattle riots and the world trade organization. And we started having these conversations around supply and demand and production and consumption and looking at the interplay between the consumer and the, the working conditions of people in like a Mecca and like all this sort of stuff. Right. And I started thinking about porn in the same way, you know, like a few, you know, punk rock and hardcore songs were touching on like feminist, Mm, concepts uh shouting in the, at me literally <laughs> and um it started making me think about this stuff and there used to be a website called one angry girl i don't think it's a thing anymore yeah i remember it, that one saying yeah it was like a message board and like there were a lot of articles and i started reading a lot of like robert jensen who i subsequently emailed like 15 years later and i was like yo man that's what you know i would I talk about you all the time <laughs> and there's a photo of me with your quote huge at a university and yeah he, oh, i've been in touch got, with him for a really long time we did a yeah i don't know him personally together, but like, a couple of panels yeah he really shifted my thinking and and part of that is exactly what you're talking about megan like i don't know like the lived history of every person in pornography and when i've read around uh like uh who was the really famous porn star that his name escapes me right now? And she, Jenna, Jenna Jameson. Yeah. Yeah. Jenna Jameson and people like that. They were like rape victims and abuse victims. And, you know, I worked in alcohol and drug harm and I, I do a lot of mental health advocacy and we see people play out like their trauma all the time. Like we recreate what is familiar to us, not as what is good for us. And if our um, early conceptions are our worth is found in sexuality, then that can play out inside a culture that we've been dissecting today where women are still uh, given their most value for their sexual worth and how they look a lot of the time, right? Like, that hasn't changed a lot, I would argue. And it's shifting. Like, it is great that we have a broader idea of what beauty is and we're starting to push back on beauty standards, but still, you're still meant to, you know, have, you know, big breasts and be skinny and straight hair and look a certain way and behave in a pornified manner when it comes to your sexuality, right? So I think we need to develop empathy as consumers of porn or people who might be looking at stopping consuming porn or at least we're changing our relationship with the sort of porn that we consume. And I remember, I think it was, uh, was it Rashida Jones uh, did that series Hot Girls Wanted? Yeah. And she got a lot of flack for that. Like she got hammered, I think, by like the liberals. I feel yeah. like such a reactionary saying the liberals. Well, I'm I know and I keep... Yeah, I'm like I say liberal. that all the time too, and I keep being like, maybe I should stop saying liberals because, yeah, like, yeah. I'm a liberal. I'm, and these people I'm don't seem liberal, to be liberal. I know. Yeah, I remember, like, that I'm, was a really good documentary, and I actually I talked to her. Did you after that? Yeah, you she contacted me. Yeah, I'm like, yo, you're awesome. <laughs> tell her like this dude in New Zealand thinks. Well, she's everyone awesome. was telling her she was wrong, and then they found me saying, you know, she's not wrong because I think I wrote something about it or I tweeted about it or something like that, and she was sort of like you know, thank God, like, that you're, like, the only one who's saying this stuff. But, and then I think she still kind of got bullied into backtracking after that. But that was, it was a good documentary because, like, she was accused of slut-shaming, essentially, which she That's was That's what I got doing. accused of when we first met. I was right. accused of slut-shaming, which I wasn't doing. <laughs> I was just saying, 
hey, as men, maybe we need to understand that women are worth more than their bodies. <laughs> yeah, and is this good for girls and, and women good to be girls? thinking that their primary worth is in their ability to like gain validation through objectification and sexual right. But that doc um, that like hot girls wanted or whatever, I mean, that was about exposing the realities behind the porn industry. A lot of the recording industry. Like the fact that there's a website called Facial Abuse that girls are deep throated to the point of vomiting and then they're encouraged to like lick up their own fucking vomit. And that's what like millions of dudes masturbate to. That's heartbreaking. I don't think we should be critiqued for saying that it's kind of damaging that as consumers of that, we have to turn off our empathy. Yeah. And what makes us human is our empathy. You know, we, a lot of people will be like, well, men need to stop being violent and men need to hold other people to account and men need to walk a mile in our shoes and then say nothing about porn like that, which is ubiquitous. Like that just seems to me to be like so contradictory that it hurts my brain talking with you about it now. Like we can, we can like cancel someone for some genuinely sexist behavior or harassment that may have not crossed the lines of legality, but it was definitely creepy and shit. And that we should, we should push back on. But at the same time, we don't talk about this, which is teaching boys and men that like the casting couch and forcing girls to give you a blow job and maybe they'll get a fucking job isn't somehow responsible for this like what like what the fuck like how can you and how can you, you say that that's you, wrong you, but then yeah. say, stay silent on how, this thing how like, can you say the actual behavior of saying if you give me a blow job i'll give you a job is wrong but a million and one porn scenes that young people are consuming from day dot recreating that fantasy isn't like do you not see that there is um a contributing fact i'm not saying porn is responsible for sexual violence but i am saying that it is a contributing factor to a socialization process which devalues women and girls which normalizes coercive abuse which teaches boys and men that your sexual gratification is potentially more important than someone's willingness to be involved in whatever it is that you want them to do. And then um, I just think it's just such a like ignored part of the problem of sexual violence. And that's something I think we really need to do a better job of talking about. And unfortunately, the polarity of the internet and the, the lack of going back and forth can fucking just keep it, keep the status quo going. Like, um, and I'm not really sure how to address that. Yeah, I mean, I I feel concerned about that that compartmentalization, dehumanization aspect, in more than one way. I mean, we were talking briefly earlier about like, I, like I I worry that porn discourages emotional intimacy mm. and connection, right? Like, and you know that like you said, like that is such a big part about sex. Like it's a really intimate act and we're treating it as though it's not an intimate act. And it doesn't, I don't mean it always has to be this like moving, <laughs> like making love thing. Yeah. Like I'm not anti- Candles don't uh, have to be lit. Like the yeah. soundtrack doesn't need to be like strings. Yeah. Yeah. Like it can just be physical and fun, but you know, when you're with your a partner, like it is a, it is a form of connection and, we pretend like it's not, and porn definitely pretends like it's not. Yeah, I know. And um, that's a shame yeah. because, hey, maybe no one broke the law and everything was consensual, but that doesn't mean, like, hurting people's feelings is a good thing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Do you right. know what I mean? Like, yeah. Does it mean you should mean, call like... people names in bed? <laughs> yeah. yeah. If someone says, call me a slut or whatever, hey, whatever, I, but, like, if you just start doing that off the bat, because that's what you think is normal and they're not cool, if they're not down with that, then that's a problem. Yeah, you know? and it, it's teaching. It does, like, when we talk about sites like facial abuse, like, it's essentially, you, you said this earlier, 
Um, it's teaching men to shut off their compassion. And I think that's a really dangerous thing. I mean, dehumanization in any context is dangerous because I think obviously it allows you to treat another person badly if you can pretend that they're not a full human being. And there, then we have these images all over the internet and these videos of women being, you know, choked with a dick, you know, really, and like crying and obviously in pain and obviously, you know, in the obviously. and men are supposed to walk like and then men are teaching themselves to be turned on by this and masturbating to this like it's really it's troubling in a lot of different ways not only because of what's happening to this woman in real life and you, i mean you can't pretend that a person is genuinely enjoying themselves when you're, you're watching this kind of thing you can pretend in other contexts you know these people maybe are good actors or whatever yeah. but then it's also it's training people to turn off their empathy. And in this world, what we need is more empathy, not less empathy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, you know, that's exactly right, Megan. Like I, I, I entirely agree. And I struggle to under, like, that's a controversial statement for some people. Like, like, you know, the maker of Hawkeye's one got a hard time for the expose that she made. You know, and I, you know, I referenced that Nicholas Kristoff, um, article you should check it out i'll send it to you if you don't have i've it. read it i've read it sorry oh, yeah. i couldn't remember specifically but, um, said, but I, yeah i did read that when it came out again like we, when we're turning off our empathy we don't know if the people in the porn that we're watching want to be there like there's sex trafficking you know i know fight the new drug are actually doing a whole campaign about like people get trafficked into porn you know there is people who are coerced into it people who made it maybe consensually, and now they don't want it to be there anymore, and they're trying really, really hard to get it off. There are people who made a consensual intimate video, broke up with their boyfriend, and that's been uploaded, and it's revenge porn. Like, all of this stuff is part and parcel of what porn is. And like you said, it's not just going to a porn site. It's ubiquitous across all our social media platforms. And no one seems to, not no one, but like, you're kind of in the uncool minority if you want to talk about it in a constructive, critical fashion. And, and that really troubles me because I've been to schools and kids are literally raping other kids in the locker room or they're um, being pressured into sending nude images or doing a sex video and then it goes around the group chat of the football team. And then that kid will like cut their wrists or drop out of school or be branded a particular way. And I'm not making this up. Like this is not a, these are not atypical experiences. These are pretty commonplace experiences across any sort of school, um, not just in my country, but in yours or the United States or, you know, the, the Western speak, Western world, you know? And, um, yo, if we, if we want to change that, if we want to turn our figures around, violence against women and girls and violence against boys and men too because we need to understand that boys and men are often victims of sexual abuse at the hands of other boys and men um and women too but if we're looking at the numbers and the data it is asymmetrical and the perpetrator is gender um or sex sorry um we need to fucking talk about it at least and then figure out technological and sociological interventions better education mm -hmm. mm, better education better uh, filters better um better pathways to help you know like if if you better better ways to um limit your kids access to certain sites on the internet until they're at least 16 or 18 or whatever it might be again like i said earlier banning stuff doesn't work but you know delayed onset is a good thing you know we don't want our kids drinking and doing drugs while their brains are still developing you know i'm pro legalization of drugs uh because i don't think that war on drugs has worked and has actually made things way worse but i still don't want like 14 year olds doing coke right like wait till your brain's a little bit more solidified <laughs> or smoking weed or drinking heaps of alcohol like these things are detrimental to our neurological development mm -hmm. porn can be the same um, I don't want to keep you too much longer because I've kept you for a long time already, but I really did, I'm like, I find 
you and your work interesting in a lot of ways. And, you know, one of the things that I find interesting is like your long history in fighting in Muay Thai. And, yeah. um, I, and I guess I'm curious because I think a lot of people who don't know much about um, martial arts, Muay Thai fighting, think of this as sort of like, peak toxic toxic masculinity <laughs> if you if you want like you know it's like brutish <laughs> like it's just it's like a bunch of guys like beating each other up like it's terrible like it's just violence and yet you say you know it saved your life and i i agree with you like i think it is a really positive thing and i've sort of been learning a bit more about it recently and i've started i've been working with like a boxing trainer i'm cool. not good for the past like year and a half or something <laughs> like that i don't want to be like oh now i know because i don't know much of anything but i love it i really enjoy it and i found it very empowering and it's obviously like a great workout mm. and it's very it's not it's not at all just about hitting it's about like so much more than that like mental stuff and like you're using your whole body it's on, and i think it's always kind of good to learn new skills and challenge yourself i one of my i don't regret very many things in my life but one of the things that i do regret is that i didn't start doing this when i was like 20 because now my body is in pain all the time and I, you just, i'm just like i'm so slow and it's so frustrating and my knees hurt. like but yeah, um, I, I mean how does that like factor into you know like how would you challenge those narratives or like what was what does this mean to you and what does it mean to the like boys and men that you're you're working with yo it gives me like an instant pass to have this conversation if i if i'm honest right like uh i don't think i would have got the cut through or the popularity um at least in my country um doing the work i do if i wasn't like a former champion fighter you know, so I go into schools and I always tell a bit of my story and there's some photos of me looking hyper alpha, <laughs> you know, like I'm super muscular and I'm fighting and it grabs young people's attention because they've been socialized to valorize that concept of masculinity. And then I'm like, yo, but this isn't what it means to be a, a man. This is just about one aspect. And like, if you are not into sports or you're not into combat sports, if you're into the cello and writing poetry, we shouldn't treat you any less, right? And it's kind of like a pathway into that chat. It kind of like it juxtaposes like how I look and what I did for sport for 20 years. I competed in one martial art or the other. You know, I've had my fought in Thailand and Japan and Australia and, you know, I had my face busted up and all of this sort of stuff. And at the same time, I'm talking about the importance of emotional vulnerability and respecting uh, women and not being homophobic and, you know, breaking down some of the, the social um, the socialization of stereotypical manhood. It, it actually works to, to like, it's a treat. And I never planned it, right? It's all just been a really organic evolution of how my life's played out. So that works. You know, I remember when I first walked into a maximum security prison here, I've only done that a couple of times. And two guys were like, yo, man, I've seen you fighting. <laughs> and it was like, cool, okay, that's good, because I'm quite nervous, right? And they listened, you know what I mean? And and, and I know a couple of those guys now like that. They've been released from prison and, and yada, yada, and they, they're like, they're supporters of the work I'm doing. It gives you some legitimacy, right? It gives me some credibility. Like, yeah. I'm not just another fucking pointy hat in a cardigan, right? Like, <laughs> it's like uh, telling them what's up. Because I have, I am, like, look at me. Like, I'm wearing, like, chains and I'm covered in tattoos and, like, I swear a lot. And I know what it's like to want to be tough. You know, I was a super insecure kid. You know, my dad's a chronic alcoholic, all this sort of stuff. A lot of the men that I work with have similar histories or, or far, far worse ones. Like they've been through horrific abuse. I haven't been through horrific abuse, right? Like definitely had dysfunctional childhood. But what got me through all of that in a positive pro-social way was dad when he was in a period of recovery because he's always been off and on from chronic alcoholism, <laughs> like just like dry knuckling it, um, was taking me to a Taekwondo school as a teenager and being like, I'm not doing a good job as a dad. Can you help out my boy? And um, I'm fucking super grateful for him because now 
20 something years later, I have boys through my gym or the gym I work at who have had similar stories and I see the positive impact on them. I see them moving away from drugs or stepping away from gangs or um, all of that. And, and I actually did a body of research. I, well, I contributed to a, a big body of research for UNESCO um, maybe three or four years ago. And we looked at martial arts programs and how they um, helped young people enrolled in them move towards achieving the United, Station, United Nations um, Sustainable Development Goals. Literally, like, we did all this huge body of research, and I found, like, like people in favelas in Brazil and, like, places in, like, Dublin and England and different parts of the United States that were, like, you know, socially and commonly marginalized. The outcomes across the board were in well-structured, well-taught martial arts programs, whether it was capoeira or Muay Thai or Jiu-Jitsu or boxing. These kids did better because they had a sense of purpose, they had pro-social coping mechanisms, they had a place to put all their feelings that wasn't drugs or alcohol or fucking the internet or self-harming behaviors. It gave them a positive catharsis, it gave them a community, it gave them goals, it gave them life skills, how to turn up on time, how to eat better, get to bed on time, like how to apply yourself, like the sense of worth, I'm feeling emotional I'm talking about it, they're like the sense of worth that comes from um, working hard, you know, like it's hard to be a fighter. Whether you have one fight or you have 40 fights or 100 fights, it's always difficult. And we live in this fucking culture of like fragility now. Like everyone is like upset and like on eggshells all the time and they fall apart at the slightest challenge. Yo, have someone fucking punch you in the face as hard as they can and keep trying to win right? Like that's good for you on some level. Hey, you might be watching this and like, well, I don't want to get punched. Face. Well, you don't have to punch face, lift some weights, go <laughs> run up some fucking mountains, like do shit that's hard for you. And I guarantee that it's positively transformational. Doesn't have yeah. to be, doesn't have to be violent. No, I know it, this it, thing where like, it's, it's like challenging virtual. yourself and overcoming your fears and yeah, like doing something that's hard and doing like, I think people, especially young people are not getting this idea that it's like, you're not supposed to avoid hard things and you're not supposed to avoid scary things. You're supposed to do the things that you're scared of. You're supposed to do the hard things and you're supposed to keep that's going it. even when you that's... fail or you get punched in the face or it hurts or whatever. Dude, stress is good for us. The problem with I'm on site is that too much of us have too much stress too much of the time. But the fact of the matter is, is that the opposite is also detrimental to our development as human beings. And we need to be put through difficult things in order to develop and grow both physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. And it seems that some people think that that's a bad thing. And, and um, that's a real shame. So now, like I work with Four different charities. I have women who have got lived histories of abuse, incarceration, and sub like serious substance abuse. They come through the gym every week and they fucking love it. They've been coming for over a year. And those that stick with the program, yo, they're getting such benefits from it. I have um, young people who've been experiencing homelessness, like long term living on the streets, or um, adults from the same organization, again, who've been sleeping rough or have long, like, lived histories of you know, homelessness. I have um, kids in alternative education who have been excluded from the mainstream system. And they're all like getting so much out of the training that we do. And, and then that training creates like a, an environment where we can talk about real shit. You know, like I don't just jump off the bat and be like, yo, what's up? Let's talk about your childhood. Like, <laughs> but you build like a rapport and a respect. Um, through turning up for them every day and teaching them what you know, and they will give it back over time. And then they will start trusting you. Like I work with some really, really hurt people. You know, Th this group of women I work with, uh, we got into talking once because we're stretching and we kind of have a bit of a chat after training. And I remember I went to a woman's prison once and every female there had been in an abusive relationship and we kind of got talking about that. But then it turned out that the work group woman I worked, every one of them had either absentee father, a father or stepfather who beat the fuck out of their moms. Sorry. <laughs> or, and they've all gone on to recreate that in their own lives. And then in front of their own children, which means their own children are, 
um, more likely to recreate that, right? And it feels really good to help them in their path of healing, you know, in a, in a tangible sense, in a way that they relate to. And it's actually really fascinating how much self-responsibility that a lot of people take when they when they come to the gym. Like it, you know, a lot of them turn up in bracelets, right? Like uh, they call them Rolexes. But like when you're on bail, or you're um, or you're waiting a waiting sentencing, or you've been released and you're on parole or whatever, you have electronic monitor monitoring. So we can't kick, so we have to knee and punch and stuff. And they call them a Rolex. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yo, that one of them was talking about how it hurt. And I'm like, yo, I'm really sorry. Like, and they're like, it's all good. It's my own fault. Like, I shouldn't have kidnapped this person or whatever. And it's actually, it's kind of quite counter to how a lot of, I think, a lot of our social justice conversations seem to have devolved to where it's never our fault. It's a very interesting paradox for me as a person who tries to navigate all these kind of different spaces in life. And um, yeah, regardless, I understand how the marketing of martial arts events like the UFC can lead people to think that um, it is all this really hyper masculine shit, right? But that I would argue that's more to do with capitalism than it is to do with the inherent nature of martial arts. So you think about the traditions that martial arts come from, there, there's a lot of philosophy, there's a lot of spirituality, there's a lot of religion. Think about Thai boxing, it's really steeped in Buddhist tradition um, that actually have like really worthwhile tenets that I think all people can apply to their lives. Uh, and people might come for the, the muscles and how to kick someone in the head, but actually it's uh staying in that space that is positively transformative you know well and, yeah, and and that, yeah sorry no go i mean you were like what you were talking about before but was that like this accountability thing like it's like <clears throat> which is discouraged oftentimes in our culture whereas like i think that a lot of people might not understand that you know taking responsibility for your choices and maybe even and your circumstances in life and the bad things that have happened in your life not all of it's your fault but you know taking responsibility for your life is actually very empowering it's not about victim blaming it's about like empowering dude. yourself to take control over your life which is a really big deal dude my friend jimmy hunt he's like a mental health educator so advocate speaker here he wrote a book and and it, he talks about how look you actually need to take radical self-responsibility for your life if you want to improve your mental fitness. You do. Like, you are not just going to magically get better. You're not. You actually have to change who you hang out with. You actually have to change what you put in your body, what time you go to sleep, what what pastimes you, you, you invest in. Like, what are you reading? Like, how much time are you spending fucking online? Like, you have to do all that stuff. You have to drive to a therapist and talk to them. You have to get in nature. You have to go do some Wim Hof and get in the ice. Like you have to do some of these things if you want to improve your health, mentally, physically, all of that. You're not just going to fucking manifest it by chucking some hashtags up on Instagram and like blaming everyone else. And nobody and owes you anything. Like there's no, no. nobody else is going to do it for you. Like life is not going to be like, oh, you're entitled to a good life. You should have it. I mean, <laughs> I wish that were true, but it's not like it's you have not to true. do, you have to make these changes yourself and you do have to take responsibility. You have to make your life better in a variety of ways. That's it. And that's what, that's what like prolonged engagement in like any sort of fight sport teaches you. You want to do well, turn up on time, do what you're told, work as hard as you can. Win, lose or draw, that's a positively transformative experience. You know, the winning, yo, that's a bonus, particularly if you're a professional and you want to make a living off this, but you will be a better person if you do this again and again and again. It will teach you not to quit. It'll make you more resilient. It'll make you more capable of dealing with the inevitable suffering that life is going to thrust upon you. You know, like we are all, everyone we love is going to die. I'm going to die. You're going to die. I'm going to get old. My, I'm not going to look the same way. Like, you know, you know, terrible things are going to happen. I need to learn how to fucking weather some of those storms or else my life is going to be horrible. And that's just basic 
Buddhist philosophy, right? And martial arts is a great tangible way of of explaining and teaching and, and experiencing that. And, and I don't know, man. I, you know, I, I wish every school had some sort of pathway like this. You know, like you have to temper the you do have to temper the hyper masculinity that comes into it. But I know dudes who've come out of jail who've like literally murdered people and um, martial arts has made them better. Like it's, it's made them better. It, it's moved them away from recidivism and it's moved them away from the gang that gave them a family because their own family didn't exist in any sort of sense. And, Fighting saved their lives too. It, 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 having done a body of like very grown up research with a very grown up international organization, I know there's a universality to that to that experience. Um, I'm so glad that I asked you that last question <laughs> because I think it's like the most impassioned so... you saw me. <laughs> yeah, if, you, <laughs> if you thought I could be even more impassioned about something, I know, I know. People watching this going. Like, I always no, find that I mean, like I really it. love me or they really hate me. <laughs> like, I so. find it hard to believe that anybody hates you, but sure. Oh, that's very <laughs> kind. Thank you. Anyway, I thought, like, thanks so much. This was such a great conversation. I'm so glad that we got a chance to talk about all of this, and I appreciate you spending almost two hours talking with me about all this. I mean, I'm sure there's, like, a million more things that we could talk about. And yeah, let's, we'll let's get do it again. That. Yeah, let's absolutely. do it again, or I'll try and re um, restart my own humble little YouTube series, and you can be a guest on my show. I don't know. Let's keep. Yeah, in I'd touch. be happy really, to, and yeah, yeah, it'd be for cool. Sure. I, I've really enjoyed talking with you, and um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. <laughs> Bye. Bye.